Welcome to the Vault XL. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Please be safe. Two years ago, when I discovered the missing boys from Cal City, I stumbled across this story pertaining to Desiree Thompson. I briefly spoke with her mother about her disappearance and the disappearance of others out there in the desert. And there were no clues, no information pertaining to her disappearance. I told the mother to stay on it, to keep talking to people, news agents, Mr. Bayan Wong. I said, stay on it. Somebody will pick up the story. And they did. I never even got any information that her remains were even found. So my apologies. Because usually I try to keep up with uh, stories that I cover, but there have been so many that I've covered. Sometimes it happens to where I don't get any information or updates because because naturally you have to have the apps for each news agent that covers the stories that you speak about. So here we are present day. Her remains have been recovered. Some people decided to come forward to tell where her body was. And as I have always told you with true crime, the killer has to tell somebody. And he did. And it wasn't who they thought it would be, the mother at least. The mother assumed it was the, uh, I believe it was the husband or boyfriend or whatever, but we now know that it was not. We're going to go back in time pertaining to the disappearance of Desiree Thompson from Cal City. And we're going to work our way up to the conviction of Mr. Lara yesterday. In court, he has been found guilty of first degree murder. Thank you for joining me. Well, for a decade, a woman's disappearance in California City has gone unsolved. While Desiree Thompson is just one of eight cases considered cold out of Cal City, police and her family are hoping someone will come forward with even the smallest detail to help them. It's been 10 years since Sherry Smith last heard her daughter's voice. I miss her. I'm sorry. She, um, she was just a beautiful person. Desiree Thompson's mother, Sherry, says having no answers to her daughter's whereabouts after all these years leaves her disheartened. I'm so frustrated with this case. I just want closure for my daughter. I want to bring my daughter home and I want justice to be served. I don't want everybody held accountable. According to Smith, the morning of January 7th, 2012, she went to go see her daughter, Desiree, who told her she'd been in an argument with her estranged husband. She said it was here at their home on 68th Street in Cal City that he threatened Desiree with a shotgun. Later that evening, Smith says her daughter was at an acquaintance's house using their cell phone and that she wanted to go back to her home that night. The next day, Smith went to her daughter's home to find she wasn't there. Another acquaintance said she never returned that night and they reported her missing. Smith said she called back the number Desiree had used the night before and the owner of the phone said Desiree had gone to the Cactus Mini Mart to buy a cigarette. It was here on 83rd Street that Desiree was last seen. For someone just to vanish without a trace, of course, that's that's unusual. Cal City Police Chief John Walker said Desiree's estranged husband, Edward Gibson III, is a person of interest and has a history of domestic violence. But he says so far, they've yet to find concrete evidence connecting him to Desiree's disappearance that night. Because you only get one shot. You only get one bite of the apple. So if you don't have enough to convict them and they walk, the double jeopardy thing comes in. A former investigator on the case said the department has worked hard and is actively investigating cold cases like Desiree's, but overturn and a lack of resources over the years has made it difficult. Chief Walker saying the difficulty with these cases isn't a lack of resources, but making sure they get it right all the way through to conviction. We, we're we pretty sure we still know where to find him if need be. And now that's what would happen if we got that nugget of evidence to say, hey, this person actually did it. You know, we have the DNA to prove it. We have an eyewitness. We have a video. Smith taking little solace in this, saying she knows there are witnesses to the domestic dispute that evening, and she knows her daughter would never leave her children and go this long without any contact. When does your conscience start working? When does the compassion come in to help these families? 
Now, there is a $25,000 reward for any information regarding this case. Anyone with information is asked to call Cal City PD at 760-373-8606. All right, everybody. ABC 23 is the source. This is older content from a year ago. I'm taking you back in time because her remains were found last year. And they have a suspect who has been tried in court yesterday, and Mr. Laura, and he was found guilty. Let's go back to when Ms. Smith found out information pertaining to her daughter. Questions about the man who has been arrested in connection to her daughter's murder. 17's Christian Galeno in studio tonight with the latest. Christian. Now, Cherie Smith prayed for 10 years that she would get to hug her daughter once again. A decade later, her patience has run thin, and a twist in the case confirms her worst fears, but leaves her even more confused. The day Desiree Thompson disappeared without a trace was the day Cherie Smith began to suspect her son-in-law, Edward Gibson III, could have done the unimaginable. It's mind-boggling. I'm still trying to process this, and I can't. A difficult thing to accept as 60-year-old Jose William Lara, a complete stranger to Desiree's family, is suspected of her death. I never would have thought in a million years that I'd be standing here right now with that person being a suspect. A decades-old case was another file gathering dust among several California city cold cases. A $25,000 reward was put in place to hopefully get the wheels of justice moving. In a statement to 17 News, California City Mayor Jeannie O'Loughlin says no one has claimed the reward yet. Quote, I have not heard any mention of anyone claiming the reward. Our reward is based on arrest and conviction. I have yet to receive confirmation of the identity of the body, so I reserve comment for now. We received some information, very reliable information. We believe enough information that we could go ahead and obtain a search warrant for this location on the crime we we believe occurred several years ago. Friday's search ended in the discovery of human remains, which have yet to be identified. At the end of the day, um, this is bittersweet because it's not the way I wanted to bring my daughter home, but I'm able to bring her home now. And now it's time for justice. Now you can find all of the coverage on Desiree's Thompson story, as well as a timeline that traces her last steps on our website, KGET.com. Reporting in studio- all right, everybody. KGET is that set of news. Pertaining to uh, Desiree, as I said, we're going back in time. In the case of Desiree Thompson, the young woman who went missing a decade ago in California City. Tonight, the coroner confirms remains found in March belong to Desiree. The 30-year-old was reported missing on January 7th of 2012. More than 10 years later, on March 25th, skeletal remains were unearthed by the FBI and California City Police at a home in the 20,300 block of 86th Street in California City. The Kern County coroner said the remains underwent DNA testing by the Department of Justice, which concluded they belonged to Desiree Thompson. We spoke with her mother, Sherry Smith, shortly after the discovery. I believe it's my daughter. This is the first time in all these years that throughout them finding remains around, you know, between Rosamond and Lancaster, you know, and out there, this is the first time that I literally... So, feel this is her. The coroner says the manner of Thompson's death is homicide. 60-year-old Jose William Lara was arrested in March and is facing charges of murder. He has pleaded not guilty. All right. This is content from a year ago. Just bringing you up to speed because he was convicted of first-degree murder, Desiree Thompson, yesterday in a California court. So, we're just taking you back in time pertaining to this investigation. Thank you all for joining me. If you'd like to donate to this great network, dollar sign Beganji, one, two, nine cash app. All stickers and chats are welcome during this live stream. KGET news is the source man guilty of murdering Cal city woman who was missing.
for 10 years. High profile case out of California City, 60 year old Jose William Lara has been found guilty of first degree murder of Desiree Thompson, who was reported missing more than 10 years ago. Thompson's body was located in March of last year after an informant told police that Lara talked about killing a woman with the same description as Thompson. During his confessions to the informants, Laura said he bashed Thompson's head into a mini fridge and stabbed her and then buried her in the backyard of his home. Laura now facing life in prison. How did it come to be that she crossed his path? Did she go directly to that store to buy a cigarette? Did he see her walking, offered her a ride? Did he kidnap her, force her into a car? Are there other people involved besides just him? So far, he's the only one that has stood trial for the murder. And I think it's so sad and pathetic that one, he killed her. He confessed the crime to some random ass people and they held the secret, as I've always told you. There will be somebody that knows the secret besides the perpetrator. And they're just as sick as the perpetrator to hold it. Why, why would you just come forward last year to say, oh yeah, I know about this crime. She had been missing for years. You could have told it when you found out where she was located. So all this time, the mother, family are wondering where she is, if she's alive, if she's deceased, and all this time she's buried in someone's backyard. This is horrific. But she's out of that place now. No longer in this man's backyard. But how did it come to be that they crossed paths and he beat her, stabbed her, and buried her in the backyard? This is bad. This is why I tell you, you have to be very careful of your surroundings and where you go and who you talk to, uh, ladies especially, because you don't know people. It doesn't matter if someone's wanting to offer you a drink or a ride or take you back to their home or your home or wherever. You do not know people and you can't trust people. And even people who you think you know or know of or through another person, that does not mean that they will play fair. That's just the bottom line. Because as my aunt once said, once the door is closed, all bets are off. I'm going to bring you the said commentary pertaining to Desiree Thompson. Thank you for joining me. I will be back on right before 2 p.m. for the Jacqueline and Trezell West verdict. The jury has made a decision. Will they find them guilty or not guilty? What I find interesting about this trial here with Mr. Laura, they deliberated for 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes. Because naturally they had remains, so I guess they didn't have anything to fret over. 30 minutes, they had a verdict. Lori Vallow, they needed a whole day. Had remains in that case with her husband. So you see, every jury is different. Some juries, they don't need a whole day. They don't need four or five hours, six hours, two days, three days. Hey, the body was there. <laughs> Guilty. That's enough for us. Let's see what happens later today with the West trial. Okay, everybody, I'm going to bring you information pertaining to uh, this horrific crime in the desert. And I want to tell you something. When you watch these videos, these, uh, these clips, you see that desert. It's so barren. I get the same feeling I got with Cal City when I was watching all this stuff unfold with the boys missing and some of these YouTubers were going out filming at the house. I got the creepiest feeling watching them walk around, knocking on the neighbor's doors and walking through the streets, talking in the neighborhood. I got this sick, sick feeling because it's so barren out there. I'm just like, why would anyone want to live out here? I mean, you know, to each his own. But I'm the type, I want to be near the gas station, the grocery store. I want to be able to see something. I live in a very green space. It's very green here in East Tennessee. So when it's spring, summer, it's full bloom with trees, bushes, flowers. There's nothing out there in that desert. But just sand. I call it sand. Clay dirt, whatever. There's nothing. And I remember one 
early evening, I was dozing off listening to somebody on YouTube. And I'd wake up every, you know, 10, 15 minutes out of my sleep listening to them talk. And I'd get a glimpse of the neighborhood that they were walking around. And I just got the creepiest feeling like, dear God, are these children out here? Are they buried somewhere out here? That desert, that's the scary part about it. It's not appealing looking. And then the thought of knowing that somebody is buried out there somewhere. Because we know that this is a place where bodies have been unearthed, have been disposed of throughout time. And it's just a creepy feeling just looking at all that land and knowing that there's probably a lot of dead people out there who've been disposed out there. Let me hurry up and give you this commentary so I can get back on here uh, for the West trial. Jury returns guilty verdict in decade old Cal City cold case. According to courtroom observers, the jury deliberated for less than 30 minutes before returning a verdict of guilty in the trial of Jose William Laura. In less than 30 minutes, 12 Kern County jurors returned a guilty verdict in the case of Jose William Laura. Laura is accused of killing Desiree Thompson in California City 11 years ago. He wasn't overwhelmed, said Prosecutor Christine Antonius during her closing statements. He was almost bragging about it. The case drew years of media and community attention as Thompson's mother fought to keep her daughter's memory alive. Thompson disappeared on January 7, 2012, the last place she was seen was leaving a local market supposedly heading home. She would never make it back, though. Earlier that evening, Thompson had been in a domestic dispute with her husband, Edward Gibson. Gibson kicked in the door and threatened Thompson with a shotgun, ultimately making him a suspect in her disappearance. However, as the years went one, went on, Gibson was never charged in Thompson's case. Eleven years later, though, someone was. The prosecution argued that Laura, angry over an assault at a, at a party, picked Thompson up as she was making her way home that night. Antonio's argued that Laura took Thompson back to his home, killed her by, <clears throat> excuse me, crushing her skull, burned her body and buried her in his backyard. Antonio said that after he killed Thompson, Laura admitted to his crimes to two men, Javier Morphin Sr. and his son Morphin Sr. would wait years before he finally went to police, but he would eventually be the one to help investigators break open this case, Antonio's argued. Morphin Sr. told police Laura described killing a woman one night and burying her in his backyard. Police searched the home in 2022 and found Thompson's remains. Antonio's argued that if Laura hadn't killed Thompson, why would he have confessed in such detail to others? Deputy Public Defender Mark Stamper argued that the story the prosecution gave the jury was just that, a story. Stamper argued that it wasn't his burden to prove who killed Thompson. It was up to the prosecution. He said so far they hadn't done enough. The defense argued that it was more likely Thompson's husband, whom with she had a history of domestic violence, who killed her and hired Laura to dispose of the body. Very interesting. Stamper argued this would explain why her blood was found in his home and her remains in his backyard. He said the idea that Laura would kill Thompson, who was a stranger to him. Even if Laura had told the Morphers he killed Thompson, Stamper argued, it could be just as reasonable that he knew details because he was involved in disposing her body, but didn't kill her. The defense continued to push that it was more likely Gibson was involved, given that after that night, he fled from the police. Stamper said Gibson evaded police for years, even after investigators learned he was in Texas. They have not proven to you beyond reasonable doubt that Laura did the murder, Stamper told the jury. During her rebuttal, Antonia told the jury that while Gibson and Thompson had been in a domestic violence incident just hours before she disappeared, the evidence surrounding Thompson's death pointed to Laura. Coincidence is not evidence, Antonia concluded. Laura is scheduled to return to court for sentencing June 16th at 8.30 a.m. 23 ABC is the source. So she had a dispute with her husband at that time. Or let's see. Let me go back up here. Make sure I'm saying this correctly. Uh, yes. And at that time, he would be the likely suspect. Miss Cherie, the mother of Desiree, assumed that he was the suspect after listening to her uh, testimony pertaining to their relationship, I thought the same. But is it perhaps she was leaving the store? He offered her a ride or offered her a cigarette, a drink, or something else. She complied, went willingly with him, and sadly, he took her home and 
things got out of hand? Or is the husband involved and use this man to dispose of his wife? I don't know. You have to have a connection, though. And that would be up to the burden of the state, of course, to prove that her husband knew this Mr. Laura and had him bury her in his backyard. What I'd like to know is the proximity of his house at that time from that corner store. How far is it? Is it in walking distance from his house to the store? Because obviously he was driving in the neighborhood and they say they allegedly somebody saw her leave the store. So she obviously made it to the store and perhaps he did see her walking off for a ride. Maybe he was sitting somewhere watching. They said he was mad about some assault. I don't understand what that means. So who did he assault before seeing her? crossing her path, Mr. Desiree. He had an altercation with someone or he hurt someone or somebody hurt him. I don't really understand that context. He was upset about an assault. So I don't, I don't understand what that means. They didn't go into detail. Uh, but as the prosecution says, he appeared to be basically bragging about killing this woman. Well, naturally, that is what you're doing, aren't you? Uh, you you're telling somebody a horrific crime that you can be convicted of. Why, why would you tell two people that you killed somebody? And what's sickening to me is that these people never said anything. This woman has been missing for years. You, I mean, how can you logically explain going to the police 10 years later about somebody's murder? Well, what are you going to say? Well, you know, uh, I really didn't believe it. But you knew that somebody was missing. There's not a lot of people that live in Cal City. So if somebody came to you telling you they killed somebody, especially if it was near the time that somebody went missing, you wouldn't think to yourself, I wonder if that's the lady that's on the news that everybody's talking about. So now we have to ask that question. Exactly when was it that they were told about her death, her murder? Okay. Did he tell them immediately after he killed her? Or a week later, two months later, five months, a year, two years. That's what I'd like to know. Now, if he told you last year, around the time you went straight to the police, that would be different. But if he told you immediately after killing her, or months, a couple years afterwards, you still had knowledge. And you waited a while before going to the authorities. So that's what I'm questioning. The exact time that Mr. Laura confessed to these two men, father and son, that he had murdered Desiree. And that's the thing about cold cases. You don't know everything. Who said what to whom, where they were, how the two people crossed paths, if there are others involved, because you have to ask that too. Was anybody else in the car with him? Was this an abduction or she willingly went with him, got in the car with him? What did he say to her to get her in the car? If she willingly went? She possibly was wanting company or to talk to somebody after having a fight with her husband. So, you know, I could see he offered a ride or stop, you know, maybe to flirt or something, possibly for facetious and nefarious reasons to stop. He's upset about something. She's had a bad night with her husband. And sadly, these two people crossed paths and a murder transpired. You have to be very careful of your surroundings. You cannot eagerly go with people, eagerly invite people back with you places, put people in your car. That's all the same because you don't know people. And as I said, that desert is vast. Runs for miles and I'm sure there are a lot of missing people buried out in the desert. Hello, Brittany. I'm sure there are a lot of people. Well, Mr. Edwards should be happy to know no one will be knocking on his door or bothering him anymore pertaining to Desiree Thompson. Desiree left behind children, as you heard in the commentary that I played. And now those children can have peace to know that their mother is deceased, how she came to be deceased, 
and remains claimed. But there's nothing like having a bond with your mother. And these children have not been afforded that opportunity because she was tragically removed from this earth by Mr. Laura. And as I said, I do not know if he had help in harming her and or disposing of her body, but 12 members of the jury work with what's been given to them. And she was found at a house that he lived at at one time or another. And it's sickening to know all this time people are concerned and worried about her. Like, as I said, she had children and she's been sitting in a yard all this time. And that's what's so scary about death, murder. People are crying and moaning over their loved ones and mourning them, not knowing their feet away from them. They're in the same town with them. Hello, Stardust. This is sickening. But Lee Cherie and the children, family members know where she is now. They have closure. Once again, he will be sentenced on June 16th, Mr. Laura. Okay, so I just got an update pertaining to uh, the West trial. Uh, jurors in the trial have submitted three notes and are returning at 11 a.m. What are the notes about? I don't know what that means. Let me pull something up right quick before I check out of here. Hold on a minute. Thank you all so much for joining me. One second, please. Oh, it's always something, I tell you. One moment. I'm going to check something out. Okay, everybody, thank you for joining me. Okay. Well, this must not really be anything, but I don't even know why they sent this as an update. Let's see. It says, after two days of deliberations, jurors in the trial of Trezell and Jacqueline West have submitted three notes and are returning at 11 Friday. I don't know what the notes are pertaining to. I don't even know why that notification came up. What's the point of telling me that? Let's see. After two days of deliberations, jurors in the trial of Trezell and Jacqueline West have submitted three notes and are returning at 11 a.m. I guess the notes mean that they were ready to vote.
And then it said, ask why the jury was returning later than its usual 9 a.m. Start time, Abela said there had been scheduling issues, okay? Let's see, the first note was submitted at 11.17 a.m. Wednesday, the jury asked for read back of testimony from one of the West children and a next door neighbor. Two notes arrived Thursday. In the first, at 1.48 p.m., the jury asked three questions, among them seeking clarification on which, let's see, hold on, on which charges applies to Orrin and which applied to Orson. Another note was sent at 2.55 p.m. Overt act can result in a guilty verdict on certain charges. Judge Charles R. Bremer sent back responses to each of the notes after conferring with attorneys. Oh, Lord, this is, I don't know. I'm getting worried now. I'm just going through the article just to bring things I thought was worth it, worth mentioning. That's basically it. So the notes is like clarification, I guess, of the acts versus the children. I'm not getting kind of confused now. Oh, Lordy, Lordy, Lordy. I don't know what to say right now. Hold on, you guys. This article just won't stop jumping off. So what is it that they want to know exactly? Did they have problems with the, the testimony? See, that's the whole point of the defense is to produce reasonable doubt. And that's probably what they've been bickering about. What the child said initially, two years ago, versus what he has said in trial. As I said, the first note, they wanted to read back one of the West children and the next door neighbor's testimony. So what about the neighbor? What is it that the neighbor said during trial that they needed a read back on? And also they wanted clarification on which charges applies to Orrin and which applied to Orson. That ain't good either. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Woo, Lordy, Lordy, Lordy. Which charges apply to Orrin and which apply to Orson? You know where that's going, don't you? We don't got nothing on baby number two. We've heard no mention of baby number two, just that we heard... The child say he heard a soap bottle fall on the floor. That doesn't mean anything, which it doesn't because you don't know anything. But we have the child saying, I know I saw this child dead. He was cold and we talked about it. Oh, Lord, have mercy, Jesus, my head. I don't know what to say. I just don't want to think the worst. I want to stay positive. I want to stay positive. But when they start sending notes and stuff, that means they're confused. Of course, natural verdict has been reached by the 12. But all I'm saying is the past two days or so, they were passing notes back and forth to the uh, judge to get clarification on information relayed in the trial by the children and by the neighbor. And that's probably the neighbor that said, what? I saw this. I saw that. Because in the end, those people really don't know what they saw. They know they saw children, but they can't verbatim say, yeah, I know this one looked like this one, and that ain't the one that I saw. And that's a problem. Because when you're seeing little children running around, if you're not paying attention, you can't say verbatim who's there, who ain't there, because, you know, one, you don't know the people. You never met the children formally. You haven't been around them, been around them to identify each one. You just know, oh, yeah, I saw little feet running, blah, blah, blah. But you can't say, yeah, I saw six, but now I only see four. It's nothing really to say unless you're just nosy and you're paying attention to say, oh, I used to see six, but now I only see four coming and going. And so these people need clarification on that child's testimony, 
I know nine times out of 10, that's what this was about. This note passing, they wanted to clarify what the boy said through trial in the initial investigation, whatever the neighbors said. So now I need to find out what did the neighbors say that they needed clarification for whatever he or she said. And that could possibly be the lady who lived behind them who said she never even saw children playing in the yard, period. So that leads us to believe, hell, they didn't even let their own children go outside, which we heard that. When YouTubers were on the ground running around at Casa Loma and they said they would see children looking out the window, looking sad. They didn't even go out to play in Casa Loma. So this is baffling to know these people had all these damn kids and they wouldn't even let their children go outside to play at either place. Damn weirdos. How can you be a child and you can't go outside to play? That's a, that's the first thing about being the best thing about being a child is being able to go outside to play. Yes, I'm going to go live. I've got to postpone whatever I wanted to do and try to bring the verdict. I don't know if they're going to live stream it or we're we just going to hear audio, but I will be here um, to get the verdict, to get you all's reaction. If anybody wants to come up on the live stream to give his or her opinion, I'll drop the link. So you can give your opinion pertaining to the verdict. I'm kind of nervous. I feel kind of out of breath right now because I don't know. Because this is the thing. You can't assume the verdict is going to go the way you think it should go. Because we learned this with Casey Anthony. She's the perfect example of how 12 idiots can sit in a box for weeks and let a criminal go free. As I understand it, they were never allowed to go outside and we are supposed to believe they were outside playing with chalk. Right, exactly. Exactly. But you got to remember, everything that we heard were from people talking to people on the ground. So when you're not around people and you're not hearing from the families and other friends close to the story, you don't really know what to believe. But that's just what we heard then. You know, almost two and a half years ago, that's what we heard. The children weren't out playing, even in Bakersfield. And all that time, you all were crazy going on and on about Chalk, thinking the dog was named Chalk. The damn dog wasn't no name Chalk. He was actually talking about real Chalk, the Chalk you right on the ground with. That's why I never fed into all that BS back then. Because I tell people, if you don't know what you're hearing, you can't clarify and say that it's this or it's that. Because that, that has happened so many times with audio. You thought you were hearing something, then somebody else would say, no, that's not what she said. No, that's not what he said. And all this time, you all, some of you thought they were talking about a damn dog. He was actually talking about chalk that you ride on the ground with, not a dog. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> this is why I said everything's about perception. What you see, I don't see. What you hear, I don't hear. And vice versa. And that's the reason why many people are hoodwinked and bamboozled every day. Because what you may see in a person, you like them, you think they're great, I don't. Maybe I think they're nice and great, you don't. Because you don't know people. And obviously nobody knew this couple. Well, I... notes and stuff because that means they're confused about something and that is the purpose of the defense as the defense said in this case here that I just read about uh, Desiree I don't have to prove anything to you I don't have to prove to you how her body got in the grave I'm just telling you my client didn't do it maybe her husband did it maybe her husband knows my client maybe her her husband killed her and he helped which, you know, it, it, it can go that way because we've learned that people do help people, bury people. Just like those two guys held the secret about where she was for years. Who's to say it wasn't another guy there at the house with Mr. Laura? Maybe he took her there to sexually assault her. Things got out of hand. She said no. So he bashed her head, beat her up, raped her, whatever. I don't know. But I know that if you are willing to tell two strangers you killed somebody... You could just as easily have had somebody with you helping you kill her, bury her. It's all the same to me. 
You don't know people. And we now know that people tell people they have killed people. You keep seeing people pop up like Jack in the Box years later. Oh, I got to tell you something. He told me blah, blah, blah. You know, just crazy nonsense. I would repeat something on this live, but I'm not going to even... <laughs> I'm not going to even say I'm not going to even say it on this live, but just just know that the queen has heard similar things. And I I tell myself. Now, should I be running to the police to tell something somebody said or do I believe them? I'm just going to say this to somebody if they're listening. If you know who shot and murdered your lover, wife, or husband, and you are stupidly letting them walk free, that's on your dumb ass. Let me say that. That's on your dumb ass. Because you can't say you want justice for somebody. And you know who the killer is. And the killer has talked to you, allegedly. And apologized, let's say. And I don't know if this is true or not, because I've learned that sometimes you can't really believe stuff that come out of people's mouth. But I'm going to say this. From my understanding, the crime has not been solved. I'm sure detectives know who shot this person, but they have to have evidence. She was there to do drugs with them or on a date. Patty, what are you talking about? Now, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't make allegations about what she was doing and not doing if you don't know her and you don't know anything about her. Don't, don't do that. Because I don't know the young lady. I don't know what she was doing and not doing. For all I know, it could have been just something as simple as he saw her and asked her, hey, you want to ride? She, she, she took a ride. I mean, you're talking about people that live in the desert. But as I was saying, don't hold a secret about murder. Because I always tell people, you don't ever want to be in that situation to where the shoe was on the other foot. But I can't understand a person knowing who's killed their spouse. And you won't tell the detectives that the person's told you that they killed them. As soon as you saw their number come up or they called you on messenger, however they contacted you, you should have recorded the conversation. That's that's all I'm going to say. And I don't know why anybody would go back and repeat it to somebody else. Yeah, uh, he said this to her and blah, blah, blah. And you people are weird out here. And I tell people, don't tell me anything. I don't want to know nothing. It doesn't concern me. And it's not, and you know, I'm a right fighter for children and things like that. But I feel like if you are repeating something that's, you know, vital information to law enforcement, you shouldn't be telling other people. You need to go to the police and tell them. You don't go spread it around to other people. That's ignorant. And this is the reason why crimes don't get solved, because as I said, a lot of people don't want to tell the truth, possibly because they fear for their safety. But I can say this due to this information, if it's true, you've gotten a lump sum of money from the murder. So it seems like to me you would want to do the right thing by telling the truth of who murdered your spouse. And I'm going to leave it at that. If indeed the allegation is true that you know who killed your spouse. That's my set information, everybody. Uh, as most of you know, uh, the jury has made a decision uh, in the trial pertaining to Jacqueline and Trezell West in the murder of their two adoptive toddlers, Orrin and Orson West. When I get more information, which will be at two, I will go on right before two uh, to bring you the verdict. We will listen in together.
And if you want to discuss the verdict thereafter, I will gladly drop the link so you can give your opinion. Prayers to uh, Cherie and her family. They now have closure with the conviction of Mr. Laura. And indeed, if anyone has any information of any other cohorts, please contact your local authority to give them the said information in her murder and any other murder and or crime. I want to thank you all for your time. God bless all of you. Please check my extensive library for said videos. I did an upload yesterday pertaining to uh, a black couple being thrown out of a restaurant in Memphis because they smelled like marijuana. Do you think the lady was right? She was a white woman. She had also done that same uh, tactic before with another couple that was a cop and a principal. Is it just she just didn't, she did she didn't like black people? She didn't want black people in this nice establishment because I do find it odd. Two times in the month of August, she approached two black people. So we're talking about four black people total in the month of August. So everybody can't be coming in the restaurant smelling like marijuana. And black people have the right to patronize anywhere they want. We are free citizens. So we do have that right. We were freed hundreds, hundreds of years ago. So we do have the right to roam now. From my understanding, when the news agents call, she no longer works there. And it's a bad look for the restaurant chain. I had Brittany check the menu prices and I double checked before going live. You know, it's not real, real expensive, but it's cheap. It's a little more expensive than buying a burger at Burger King or McDonald's. If you get my drift. And naturally, for those who know about Memphis, it's predominantly a black city. So to see somebody trying to be racist of black people entering establishments is absolutely ridiculous. Because the city is filled with black people. So why are you profiling black people in a restaurant when the, the damn city is black? That's strange to me. But that's the point. It doesn't mean that there aren't white people who are not racist. And I just learned Mississippi is a legal state for marijuana. So as this lawyer said that's representing the couple, did she ask them, are you from Mississippi? Because if they are from Mississippi, they can smell like marijuana because it's legal there. But naturally, if you're racist, you're not going to give a damn about, you see where I'm going, if they came from Mississippi or not. And it's they can legally smoke it there. She didn't care about that. And I can't see her or anybody else asking someone, hey, are you from Mississippi? That's why you smell like marijuana? Of course not. But please check out that video I uploaded yesterday. I was hanging with the fellas getting some commentary from some African-American men who wanted to, I wanted to weigh in on their opinion because all the time I'm always talking to women because men rarely like to <laughs> come up on the panel or give their commentary. So I went to the street to talk to some young men. Give me your opinion pertaining to was it right for this woman to accost this couple, throw them out, she called the police, and she also did it again with another black couple. And now we will wait to see if that couple decides to get an attorney and sue the company for harassment. And does this company have a bad reputation with accosting African-American people in other states where they have the restaurant? Houston's is the name of the eatery. And also, Brittany read some of the comments. And there were a few white people who did not have nice things to say about the service at Houston's. So Houston's, I'm going to say this to you directly. Get your you know what together. You're in one of the most dangerous cities in America. So if you have a problem with African-American people, you're possibly in the wrong damn place. How about that? Okay? You cannot go up to people telling them they smell. Because that's like one young guy who got jiggy on my, on my show said, people walk in establishments every day smelling like something. Gasoline, body odor, and they don't ask you to leave. Which is true. Because you work with people that stink, you go to school with people that stink, you pass people in Walmart and the grocery store, they stink. And you don't go call the manager to say, hey, I need somebody over here on aisle five, he's stinking up the aisle. 
Hey, she's stinking up the dressing room. You see where I'm going? Exactly. You don't go call the police. So I will weigh on she was being right, show because she did it more than one time. One time went to two times. Same month. That's two times too many for my taste. So she's done it two times. And that leads us to believe she's probably done it more than the two times. Because a lot of people smoke marijuana. And I go by people all the time that smell like marijuana. And even if you've never smoked it, you still, most people know what it smells like. And I don't imbibe. I don't smoke. I don't care for smoke, period. I don't want to be around cigar smoke, cigarette smoke, black and mouth smoke, weed smoke. Because I don't smoke. I don't want to be around it. And I don't want my clothes and stuff smelling like smoke, period. Any kind of smoke. And that stuff travels with you. That's the one thing people don't understand that smoke and smoke weed. The odor travels with you. So even if you get in somebody's car, their car smells like marijuana, even though that person never smoked it. And I tell people, I don't want the police accosting me about nothing. I don't even want to walk somewhere and somebody be like, you smoking weed? No, I don't smoke weed. Well, you smell like it. Well, I don't smoke. I don't smoke. You know, no different than being in a house where somebody cooked chicken or fish. You could have been visiting somebody's house. Somebody could be like, well, you've been somewhere where they're cooking chicken? No. I didn't cook the chicken, but I was in somebody's house. That was cooking chicken. So watch that video. Comment below the video to let me know how you feel. If you want to do a little background research on the article pertaining to the uh, lawsuit, each person is suing Houston for $500,000 a piece, million dollar lawsuit. Nine times out of 10, Houston's will settle with the couple. God forbid anybody else jumps out of a hat saying they've had negative interaction with this restaurant in Memphis. Thank you for joining me. Tune back into this network before 2 p.m. to get the West trial verdict. What will the jury say? Yay or nay? Will they walk free or will they get life and or the death penalty? Because I did not know if the death penalty was offered in this case. I've not heard much about a death penalty for Jacqueline and Trezell West and the murder of their two children. But let's say this before we leave out of here. What would be interesting if they only find them guilty in the murder of one? Listen very carefully now. Because you only have the child attesting to conversating about one child being dead, but not the second one. So what if they come back with a guilty verdict for only one boy, but not the two? Just, just, a, just a thought. If you'd like to donate to this great network, Dollar Sign Began, you one two nine Cash App. Stickers and chats are welcome to the live stream. Thank you for your support. Thank you for those who subscribe, new subscribers, those who unsubscribe. Thank you. God is good all the time. All the time. Thank you all so much for watching. Please check out my extensive library. I have thousands of videos for your delight. All types of topics. New direction for this network. That's why the name has been changed. Because we are now going to be going out to the public. To talk to the public about how they feel about breaking news. True crime. Said situations. This is an all around topic network. This is not a true crime network and I want to let everybody know that. So the next time you tune in, you may not be hearing anything about anyone's horrific death, the death of a child, just random scenarios that affect our daily lives is what I'd like to bring to the forefront on this network. And if you have a suggestion of a situation or a scenario or a hypothesis, please feel free to put it on my community page. Feel free to put your suggestion on my community page. Please take the polls on my community page. Now, I probably will go over there now and put up a new poll pertaining to this West trial verdict. Please tune back here so we can listen to the verdict together. I do not know if they're going to live stream the verdict or not. Uh, you know, show coverage of the uh, the court. We will see. Thank you so much 
for joining me. You all have a wonderful morning, afternoon rather, because I think it's afternoon. Yeah, it's afternoon. And have a wonderful and safe weekend. You have been listening to The Vault XL.